As we count down to the official handover ceremony of President Muhammad Buhari to President-elect Bola Ahmed Tinubu, tonight we discuss policy directions for the incoming administration. And President Buhari says Dangote Refinery is a game changer for Nigeria's economy. This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Ann O'Connor. As Nigeria prepares for another handover of governance structure at the federal and state level come May 29, it is necessary to discuss how the outgoing and incoming administration should manage the process devoid of glitches. There is no doubt that the quality of the cabinet and close aides of the president-elect will determine how far he would go in dealing with the myriads of challenges facing the country, ranging from insecurity to bad economy, unemployment, unstable inflation rates, among others. Analysts have called on the Tinubu Shatima administration to prioritize security and youth employment and also to formulate policies to reduce security challenges to the barest minimum. Joining me to discuss this is Ezekiel Nyaitog. He is uh, a pol political analyst. Thank you so much, Mr. Nyaitog. He's also former ADC chair, um, governorship candidate for Akwaibo State. <laughs> Oh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, <laughs> we are still in the tribunal, so I don't know where it ends, but mm. for now, yes. we're still up. <laughs> yes. Now, let, let's start by looking at May 29, whether we all like it or not, is sacrosanct. Uh, of course, the tribunal is still seating. Most recent um, is that they have kicked out the issue of televising, um, you know, the proceedings live, um, devoid of it becoming some Big Brother show, according to the justice. Um, but then many are wondering what, you know, lies ahead for this administration. And of course, as a people, the media, we need to set the conversation and set, you know, um, the ball rolling. Um, preempting what would happen. So um, let's start by looking at the problems that the Tinubu administration will face. In fact, the problems that Nigeria has on its plate right now. Most recently, um, there was a leaked tape or a leaked audio or conversation between um, a former vice presidential placeholder um, and uh, Masari and, of course, uh, the governor of uh, Kanu State, Ganduje. Um, the tone of the message, most importantly, was that they felt, you know, abandoned, or he felt abandoned, Ganduje here, uh, speaking about the fact that he's not sure that he can trust the president-elect. Now, that seems to obviously um, point to the fact that he was quoted to have met with Kwan Kwasu somewhere in Europe. And knowing that Kwan Kwasu uh, had hit Ganduje very hardly uh, in Kanu, uh, this was obviously is a cause for concern. Um, how do you think that this would obviously play out uh, in the choice of people that he would be picking to set up his cabinet? Okay, good. Um, I don't know where to start from, but they are sending me information that are ex ex extremely fundamental. One of those information is the fact that the electoral process has a beginning and an ending and nigerians need to know mm -hmm. in terms of the beginning we don't need to bother but in terms of the ending it starts to end it starts to end on the day of election after election there is the next process and it is part of the process it hasn't ended that next process is the tribunal Anything can happen at the tribunal. After the tribunal, it has not ended. There is still the appeal court. And for the case of the governorship and the, you know, presidential tickets, it does not even end at the appeal. It goes back. It only ends at the Supreme Court. Mm. You know, if you remember very well, we had the Oshun election several months back. It's only several, I would effectively say, days back that Mr. Adeleke can sit down and say, yes, I am the governor of um, Oshun State. 
you remember very well that of Bielsa, it was a day to swearing in. One day to swearing in. That there was a judgment that his running mate was not competent to be on the ticket. And on account of that, the man had to, to relinquish the seat. Mm -hmm. One day to swearing in. So um, we must um, talk with some level of cautious optimism or cautious concern depending on which side of the divide you are in. The fact that we had the first part of the ending favoring um, APC, we need to be careful not to conclude that it ends there so that there will be management of expectation. If, for instance, on Friday, the Supreme Court, considering the e issue of you know, double nomination that concerns the, the vice presidential candidate, if on that day they say that there was a case of impropriety, it could be a case of saying, sorry, you shouldn't have been on the ticket. And you know that once you are not on the ticket, your principal is also not on the ticket because it's a joint ticket. I needed to let these know so that as we talk, we talk knowing that we are just sleeping with half our eyes closed or open, depending on which side of the divide that you belong. That's the first thing. Okay. There's still the tribunal, after the tribunal, there's still appeal court. After appeal court, there's still Supreme Court. And anything is possible. Look at that of Imo State. The man was in office for about a year. And the Supreme Court says, sorry, it's not you. He had to leave office. Okay. So until the Supreme Court declares his judgment, it's not over. Luckily, uh, with our current electoral act, all that comes within six months or thereabout. So worst case scenario, within six months, we'll know who will finally be the next governor or the next president, as the case may be. But, but then we can't keep waiting. For now, there is somebody declared Mr. President. So we can now continue our conversation part two. Mm -hmm. Part two is Kano. You know... I feel sorry for Mr. Ganduje because he's a politician and he should understand that in politics, there's no sentiment. There's nothing as heartless as politics. It's a game of numbers. It's a game of survival. It's a game of the thrones. As at today, unfortunately for him, there is a new dawn in Kano State. That new don is not the governor of Ghana State. It's the one man called Alhaji Obong Kwankwaso. As a result, the man should just, uh, Mr. Ganduje should just prepare his mind to play the second fiddle. I would believe that during the electionary campaign, he had told Mr. Ashiwaju that, oh, don't worry, Kano is within and uh, have full control and this and that. So, First, there must have been a breach of trust on his side because he did not de deliver Kano as he would have. And Mr. Tinubu would have said, look, you know, I discussed with you on the understanding that you were in charge of Kano, but right now you don't seem to be in charge of Kano. I know this is a game of numbers, and Kano is not just another state of the Federation. You know, there are some states. There's Lagos, there's Kano, there's Rivers. These are some of the states that you don't treat with kids' gloves when it comes to politics. So he's got to know that you know, the game, the game is over for him. He just should just relax and pray to God that the incoming president, if he, he remains the, the president, will be able to, um, you know, accommodate him, you know, throughout. Let's, let's t talk about the policy direction of this administration, because I was about to interject when you were still talking that whether we know what's going to happen in six months or not. There has to be a policy direction. The fact that somebody has been declared president-elect means that he has to have a plan. Now, let's start with what the um, Asiwaju campaign had um, you know, put out as some of the strategies that they would employ, uh, employ in making sure that they bring Nigeria to its pride of place. Now, they talked most important, importantly about uh, social investment programs. But before we go into that, Let's look at the people that will constitute a Tinubu-Shatima government. 
Uh, many would make reference to when he was governor of Lagos State, and uh, that seems to be light years away from today, but um, many people still remember it. Um, but then the man who is president-elect today might not necessarily be the same guy who was governor of Lagos State back in the day. So my question is, um, do we see a fully formed technocrat field list as opposed to a political reward system cabinet? You see, I have always said this, and I want to repeat. There are two things I would like to bring out concerning um, Obong Tinubu. The very first one is time. And the second one is process. You see, I had a very elaborate discussion with um, a, a friend today, and I told him that there are two lines, there are two aspects in politics that we, we get mixed up. It's like in government. Government is three arms. There's the, judi there's the um, legislature, there is the um, executive, and there's the judiciary. These three form what we call government. But we also we always see government as the executive, but there are three arms, and it's very important. In politics, there are two arms. There is the round pegs, and there is the square pegs. Now, if you call the politicians the square pegs, they are those that do the politicking, they are experts, they, they know how to do the game, but there is a second arm that is called governance. Call those people round pegs. Now, when you have become an established, you know, square peg, you know, like um, Obong uh, Ashiwaju had become, he had become an indisputable kingmaker and maker over the past 20 years when he left office. He's become a brilliant first-class kingmaker. He's become the fantastic politician. His square peg size had enlarged so much. Now, when you want to transit him to become a round peg, which is the second room called governance, I do not know he will if he will be able to transit from being a square peg, which is a politician, to a round peg, which is a governance administrator. These are two different things, and we need to understand that well. But let he's there, he's there. Like they say, we're here, we're here. He is now in the field of governance. There is a second challenge that we must, you know, pay close attention to. That second challenge is the challenge I had with my mother. I've said this time and time again. My mother was this iron lady. I mean, my mother... The fear of Mandamekaite was the beginning of wisdom. She handled us with iron hand to the extent that I've never smoked because of my mother, fear of my mother. I've never taken beer, even when I went to secondary school. Something always told me, if you try it, a kaite will know and she will handle you well. Okay? Now, fast forward. I became a father. I had children. My mother comes home to stay with me. And that iron lady suddenly becomes, I want to discipline my child. I'm like, no, no, Sana, yeah, get away and get away. Leave him now, small picking. What was I? <laughs> what, was, what was that cane for? What was I? What am I trying to say? Age has a way of playing a game on people. Mm -hmm. So that Ashiwaju that we knew 20 years ago that could assemble the brightest and the best, that was ambitious, that was a go-getter, is he the same person today or has becoming a fantastic, you know, politician made him to look at things no longer from the perspective of development, but of, you know, talking about uh, political exigencies or expediency. So the question is, who is Nigeria having today on the seat of power? The fantastic politician who has to speak loud and say nothing. The fantastic politician who knows that the end justifies the means. The fantastic politician who couldn't care less whose ox is God. Or the administrator who has the milk of human kindness. 
the administrator who knows that sometimes you need to take hard decisions to be able to get where you are going. So the question number one is, which Tinubu are we having as on the seat of power today? The fantastic politician, the fantastic square peg, or the new man who is now a square peg? So that is my first concern. Then we can, like you said, as we progress, go into the possibilities of the administration. You know, the, I don't know how the question goes, so that I don't talk for too long. Yes. They go. Um, most importantly, um, because like I said, the, the, as you said, as politicians, the deals that are made, um, people make promises based on what you deliver. In the case of that Ganduji, and now talks with Kwanko. So I'm guessing that this would be something that has happened across the different regions of the country. So now that you've put, you know, that demarcation that we're yet uncertain as to who, you know, we have sitting there as our president elect, then we can't really tell, um, you know, wh what direction um, he's going to go in terms of the people who would feel his cabinet. But most importantly, let's go to um, Reverend Father Matthew Cooker's Easter message and some of the things that he pointed out. He talked about the fact that um, Nigerians um, should be the priority of the president-elect. He talks about the fact that Nigerians are angry and the first part of call for the president-elect is to seek um, you know, the unity of Nigerians, blur those lines that were obviously um, divided during the campaign season and election. Um, do you see this as an easy feat for the president-elect? Because, of course, for you to have any form of development, you must be able to get some seeming, um, you know, peace or, um, you know, some form of unity for you to be able to have a conversation with people around the table. Do you see him being able to reach across to every single Nigerian, especially after what happened during the elections? It depends on who we are going to have as the next president. Let's take the man that is already the been president given the president elect. Yeah, yeah, let's that's what I'm saying. Let's take the man that's already been given the mandate. Okay? So we let's discuss him, um, um Obong uh, Tinubu. If he comes in as the politician, he's going to think of his next election. And if he's going to think of the next election. He's going to ask himself, what sort of lines do I work on to ensure that I lay a solid foundation for myself? He's going to say, what sort of deals should I have with Mr. Wike? Number one. Number two, how relevant will he be two years from now? Because you realize that only himself in the whole of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has been able to build a dynasty that kind of um, out, out, uh, kind of is loyal to him long after they say long after the price is forgotten, the quality remains, or long after the music stops, the melody lingers. So long after he had left office, he retained power. Now, the next person that could have done that would have been a man like Akpabio, but he couldn't do it. So the question is, how relevant will Wike be in the next two years running to the beginning of processes of second term? If Ashiwaju thinks that this man is not going to be useful to him, trust me, he's not going to have any important relationship with Mr. Tinubu, uh, sorry, Mr. Wike. So that is to say, the politician, if he's the one that comes to party, is going to be thinking of his next election. So he's going to think in terms of how he can extend his tentacles. He's going to enlarge the position of Mr. Akpabio to have a large hold on the South-South. Okay? He's going to keep playing the game with Mr. Wike to ensure, while watching, to ensure that he actually gets River State wrapped up. By the time he gets River State wrapped up and he gets Kano State wrapped up, he can relax and know that second term he can play. Okay? He's also going to look for those areas but, that he but doesn't do well. he have doesn't he have to survive the first term? Don't forget 
We have so many problems bedeviling us in this country. He's going to be inheriting, inheriting um, you know, a bad economy, um, well, and a very highly indebted country where we have yeah. no idea how we're going to be paying back yeah. these loans. There's so yeah. much that is on his plate. He does have to survive that to even think of no, a second term, no, doesn't no. he? he? He doesn't need to survive that. Now, what I'm going to say now, I want you to just listen to me carefully. If we were to go into election on the basis of performance, APC will not come anywhere near. They won't even come a, 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 a second or third. They wouldn't. The politician in Mr. Tinubu knows how to win election. He knows that it has absolutely nothing to do with performance. That's what I'm saying. It depends on who is going to come to the table as our next governor or our next president. Either the politician, Mr. Tinubu, or the, 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 the government, you know, um, person that we knew of Lagos State. Okay, is we need to be able to draw that line very, very well mm. because where it tilts is what we are going to get. Now, let us wish to God that this man comes in and says, God, you've been so good to me. You've made me not just a governor, not just a senator. You've made me relevant throughout till now and you've made me a president. What can I do to give back to you for how good you have been? And God says, take care of my people feed my sheep so he comes in as this man for whom governance is everything he doesn't care whether he gets third term second term he just knows that he's got to hit the ground running so when that happens what he looks at number one is his team he's going to tell people my guys you know you help me you are politicians i'm going to make you comfortable but please allow me to get a team that is first class I want the very best team, including people who were not on my team, who were not in my party. I'm going to pro go across the land to be able to fix the economy. So I'm going to bring the, the very best hands as far as the economy is concerned. Number two, you cannot talk of economy except there's peace. There's, the peace and stability is the foundation, the bedrock for a sustainable economy. So the question is, over this period, I would have been doing, you know, I wanted to be a governor. So I did a lot of strategic analysis of sectors, of issues, of, you know, contentions, of resolutions, of possibilities. So if he did all those things, he would have known where the soft areas are with insecurity and what to do about insecurity. If he doesn't, I'm not an, a security expert, but I can tell him one or two things inside the house that will make, you see, Nigeria, most Nigerians don't understand Nigerians. Most Nigerian leaders, they are one, two things about Nigerians that the moment you just touch that, they are the Nigerians are the most believing, most trusting. They are the easiest people to govern in the whole of this earth. But if you don't understand them, they can be the most complicated sort of people. So there are one or two things. And one man that understands Nigerians very well, incidentally, is Mr. El Rufai. Everywhere, you can call him manipulative, but the guy understands what to do per time. They come back, so he's going to look for the, the I'm issue. So, I'm, I'm sorry to come in there. Did you say LFI knows what to do per time? Why is his state in shatters or in tatters? No, no, no. You see, LFI is smarter than you guys give me the credit for. Yeah, one, but, but why good. is that not showing in his state in every wise? I'm not just talking about the see, insecurity and the divisions within his see, state. He, 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 he. The first question is, what did he want? We always assume what people want. How many of us have gone behind our minds to find out what El Rufai really wanted? What would have worked for him if he had a personal ambition? Was peace really in his best interest? How many people have sat down to understand the configuration and the dynamics of the place called so, Kaduna so State? So you're assuming that El Rufai didn't want peace in Kaduna State. Why was he then trying I to be governor? I am saying that I don't know what he wanted, but I also know that he knows how to get what he wants. And unfor unfortunately, he's not moralistic about it. Hmm. From my understanding, I may be wrong.
But I see him as somebody who is not moralistic about issues. Somebody who goes for what he wants. Mm. That's the way I see him. He was FCT minister. And if you look at the way he got about sanitizing FCT, there was a major strategy which he adopted, which he always adopt. What is that? Look, why am I wasting time with the small, small boys? Catch a big fish and all the little fishes will run. That's his philosophy. And it worked fantastically well. What did he do? When he wanted to sanitize Abuja, he did not go mass to massacre one-man village, Marakwa, all those. No. He went for the chairman of PDP. He went for the general. He went for the head. He went for the juggler. He told the president, Come, are you with me? Can I do this? president said, go ahead. By the time he hit that, the whole country was like, what? Before he goes to massacre, just hearing that the the um, tractors have started revving the engine, people are already running out. They said, that man is a madman. No. If he could do that to general, who am I? He under Let me tell you, if you want to fight insecurity, look for whatever it takes. Use a sledgehammer to kill a fly and make one point. When you make that point, I'm not going to take nonsense. I'm not going to fail because of you. i got to have peace because this is not going to fail in my hand. Okay. There's something you do, one thing you do. And all those guys, they relocate. They leave Nigeria alone. They say, this madman has come. This Yoruba madman. Who knows what? You can solve that problem. But when you come and start using, you know, insecticide instead of pesticide, you know, you become a toothless bulldog. And what you have is that people come and start stroking your beards and like, hey, doggy, hey, doggy, because they know that you can only bark, you cannot bite. Okay. Show them your fans a little bit. Nigerians are very fearful in one hand. We are very daring in the other hand. Depending, do you know that when Mr. Buhari came in, within the few first few weeks, God, the fear that gripped Nigerians, hmm. they were afraid to do anything wrong. We have to go. They said, man, this guy, even the Naira stabilized everything. The body language became, you know, the thing. But suddenly, they started moving near like a child. Say, don't okay. touch this thing. We don't be moving small until it touches and discovers that that fire is not real fire. Is a, you know, illusion. Well, and well, 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 we'll wait and see what happens. Again, uh, looking at what you've said, let's see who turns up uh, after the inauguration day, the politician or the technocrat. I want to say thank you. Ezekiel Nyaitek is a former governorship candidate of the ADC in Akwaibom State and he's also a political analyst. Thank you so much for speaking with us. What a privilege. Thanks so much and God bless you. All right. Uh, we'll take a quick break and when we come back, we're going to be looking at Nigeria's Moribon refineries and of course the inauguration of the Dangote refinery here in Lagos and what this means for Nigeria's economy. Stay with us.